In Ayrshire in Scotland there is a village called Ballantrae. It's an ancient place and it has the ruins of a medieval castle which sits alongside the river, the River Stinkar. Great name. The castle originally belonged to the Kennedy clan who lived on one side of the river whilst a different branch of the Kennedy clan lived on the other side of the river. And they were always fighting each other. Something of course that relatives often seem to do, hence the need for uh, a castle. On one occasion, the Kennedys from across the river attacked the relatives in the castle and they set it on fire and it was gutted and only the outer walls remained. Those who uh, survived the attack considered uh, rebuilding the fortress and continuing with the conflict. But finally they decided that retaliation was not the answer. And instead they decided that they would put hostility to one side. But here's the really interesting thing. What they did was to take the stones from the castle and instead they built a bridge across the river, as well as an inn now called the King's Arms. And over the years, in place of conflict, peace came to that community because of that bridge. And if you go there today to Ballantrae, you can see the ruined fortress and the bridge made from the stones. In fact, if you're at House Church this morning, I'm going to show a picture of it right now. It's also a great example of what hammering a sword into a ploughshare actually means in real life. A phrase, of course, which appeared in our Old Testament reading from Micah. In fact, so powerful is that image uh, that it's been adopted by the United Nations. And if you go to their headquarters, you will see a sculpture outside the building by the famous sculptor Evgeny Viktorich Vucetic depicting a sword being turned into a ploughshare. In fact, if you're at home church, I'm going to show a picture of it now with a rather muscly bloke uh, bending the sword into the ploughshare. Micah lived in a time of enormous upheaval in the early 700s BC. And he saw that conflict in his community was an inevitability, especially as his contemporaries in Israel and Judah were frankly turning plowshares back into swords by ignoring the plight of the downtrodden, by allowing injustice to prevail and putting self at the centre of everything. But then again, aren't they always the ingredients of conflict? And if you read the prophet Micah, and I recommend you do, it's only seven chapters long. He presents a world filled with oppression, with lies, with fraud, corruption and greed. And these are supposed to be the people of God. And he speaks of God's judgment upon them, especially in the early chapters. But he also presents a picture of hope and consolation of new beginnings with God, where we don't just live to ourselves and the inevitable conflict that that brings either within ourselves or with others but we find our true focus and meaning of life in relationship with God and in worshipping him. And the result of that, of course, is the resolution of conflict both within ourselves and learning to live at peace with others, which is what is described in chapter 4. Micah longed for that day when instead of death there would be life, instead of separation, there would be reconciliation. Instead of destruction, there would be renewal. And instead of conflict, there would be peace. And swords would be hammered into plowshares. Now, Micah never saw that day arrive, but he looked forward to it. And it's one of the reasons that that reading is often read at Christmas time in the service of Nine Lessons and Carols. But Micah could never have guessed how God might bring that day about because when you look at the person of Jesus, there are clear parallels. Micah had no idea whatsoever that the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem that he spoke about would not be made of stone and mortar, but of flesh and blood in the person of Jesus. 
He had no idea that when that temple was raised up at Jerusalem above the hills, it would not be in glory, but in agony and shame at a place called Golgotha. He couldn't have known that something so brutal, so cruel and barbaric as a Roman cross, something that was used for death and destruction, could be used by God and turned around into something that has brought life and peace to millions. In the person of Jesus and in his death on the cross, we see God turning swords into plowshares. And out of the sword of the cross comes the plowshare of forgiveness and reconciliation. Here was God's bridge, if you like, to go back to Ballantrae, built across the river that divided God from his creation in the hostility that we, his people, had created. The trouble is, of course, when you look at the world today, the, the, the day that Micah longed for, all that seems a very long way off. There seem to be more swords than plowshares in the world today. And aren't we just living in a fantasy to believe that the world has changed for the better just because of what Jesus did on the cross? For example, after the Soviet Union collapsed in the late 1980s, for those of us who can remember it, we saw the incredible image of tanks literally being turned into tractors, the modern equivalent of beating swords into plowshares. And for those of us that remember that, it was an incredibly powerful image. But look at what's happened in the world since. Al-Qaeda, 9-11, wars in the Middle East, left, right and centre, world leaders who build walls instead of bridges. You don't have to look very far to see that. Always the sword seems to triumph over the plough. The moment the sword is beaten into something good, someone else seems to come along and twist it and warp it back into a weapon again. But that's where we enter the scene, because I believe each one of us has a calling as followers of Jesus Christ to live out the cross, to turn the things that can be used for destructive purposes for nurture and growth. One of the most important things I believe a Christian can do is to be an agent of reconciliation, taking the command of Jesus to be a peacemaker and living it out firstly within ourselves. That's so important. And then in our families and communities. It's part of what today, Remembrance Sunday, is all about. It is an active process of dismantling the things within us that lead to conflict, and remoulding them into things that will bring growth. And when that happens, the world does change. So let's ask some questions of ourselves. Do I really make every effort to turn a sword into a plough? Paul in that uh, reading from Romans said, love must be sincere. Well, is it? Do we really hate what is evil? and cling to what is good, you tell me. Are we devoted to one another in brotherly and sisterly love? Do we refuse to take up the sword of destruction, like gossip and criticism and putting others down, and instead we build others up through nurturing and encouraging? Do I exacerbate an already tenuous relationship, or do I try and reconcile it? Do I sometimes deliberately seek conflict? in order to inflict pain upon another person, or to punish them, or to prove myself right? Are my words and actions like a sharp cutting edge with my wife, my husband, my children, my colleagues, my friends, my employees? You know, there's always an opportunity to do one or the other, isn't there? To build up, to nurture, and bring something to harvest, or to cut it down and destroy. And the reality is that building bridges is always more important and more godly than building walls. You know, one thing that often makes me sit up and think is the part in our confession when we talk about the things that we haven't done that we ought to have done, the sins of omission. And that made me think, you know, most people don't consider themselves to be evil. They would say that they don't go around deliberately doing bad things. 
But what those words from the confession remind us of is the fact that very often we fail to make the effort to do the good thing. It's not that we deliberately take up the sword to do evil. We deliberately bash the plowshare back into the weapon. It's just that we can't be bothered to take up the plow to do the good thing. What was it that Edmund Burke said that's so pertinent to a day like today? The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I wonder how many opportunities we have had to encourage someone or show compassion or to love or to listen to someone, but we failed to do it. And when have we begun the process of forgiveness to someone who's hurt us and yet have failed to follow it through and kept that little piece of grudging resentment there to one side to use later? You know, when I think about that, I'm really uncomfortable because I know jolly well that sometimes I have started hammering the sword into a plough and halfway through, I've just left it as a piece of scrap metal. I've neglected to complete the transformation. Yes, I might have ceased using a sword with that person, but I haven't started using the plough. Hammering a tank into a tractor or a sword into plough requires hard work and effort and prayer. It doesn't come easy, as can be seen in our world. And in the cross of Jesus, God took something so brutal and barbaric, but changed it into something giving life and peace. Swords into plows, fortresses into bridges, a cross into a crown. That is what God's love can do in us and through us to others. So I challenge you, as we sit here on this Remembrance Sunday, be reconcilers. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, on this Remembrance Sunday, we thank you that you took something so terrible and turned it into an agent of reconciliation through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll forgive us for the times when we've seen the sword and instead of turning it into a plowshare, we have sharpened it so that we can cut into people more deeply. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to be agents of peace and agents of reconciliation and turn in those things within ourselves that can be so destructive and offering them to you so that you will use us for good for your loving purposes. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're part of the house church uh, groups today, uh, there's going to be some uh, questions that will appear on your screen in just a moment, and you can discuss those in your groups. And I hope you have a really good day. It's really good to see you, everybody. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.